Well, good evening, and welcome again to Sylvan Lake. Um, there's many people that live in Sylvan Lake here, but many visitors, and we welcome you to our beautiful little city. Our motto is that Sylvan Lake is the prettiest little city in the state of Michigan, and we certainly agree, the residents that live here. Our history goes back to 1818, when Reverend John Monteith rode through this area on his way to Pontiac because he had heard that there was a new post in Pontiac. And during that trip, they found a series of lakes, and they decided that Sylvan Lake was the prettiest of all. At first, it was named Timber Lake, and then, it was, then they changed the name to Sylvan Lake, which we enjoy. Well, Sylvan Lake became a village in 1921 and a city in 1947. So we've been a city for about 61 years. This is our city hall that was designed by Charles Fisher. It was built in 1929. And uh, Charles Fisher was a resident of Sylvan Lake, and he also designed Daniel Whitfield School that was um, raised in, in 2003, unfortunately. A few facts about Sylvan Lake. Uh, this is a, uh, from our website. In uh, 2003, we had 1,753 residents. We have um, 867 homes in Sylvan Lake. Some of the others might not be too interesting, but we have 566 acres, uh, water acres, between Sylvan Lake and Otter, which is connected to Sylvan Lake. So this will give you an idea of a little bit more about the history of our city. Sylvan Lake owes much, I hope I do this, to one man, uh, Merrill B. Mills. In, 18, in the early 1890s, he um, uh, bought much of the land that is now Sylvan Lake. If you can picture between Telegraph Road and Cheltenham, which is about half of our city, he bought all of that land and he decided that he wanted to make a resort out of it. So the first thing that he did was to build a uh, hotel, a resort hotel on this very property. In fact, when they built our Unity Center, during the excavation for the foundation, they found some of the um, uh, foundation from that very first inn that was on this property. Well, this is the floor plan of the uh, inn of the first floor, and you'll see one of the things in here was a billiard room. They also had a riding stable and a, um, a golf course and just everything you can imagine. It started out they were going to spend $12,000 to build this in 1893, and they ended up spending $25,000 on this inn, so it was pretty amazing. This is the second and third floors. So you can see there were many, many bedrooms in this uh, hotel. And there's also a beautiful porch that goes around the outside of the porch. This is a sketch of the building that they used for advertising purposes. And it looks like it's too bad that it didn't survive because it's a beautiful building and a very Victorian looking building that we could enjoy today. Uh, this is, uh, Joanne Eberhardt is here tonight, and she was able to find the only book that we know of about the inn. They had produced a small little booklet about the inn as a promotional, and Joanne found a copy. And so these are the only known pictures that we have of the inn. And if you look in the front of this one, you'll see that there's a buggy there. And that buggy was probably used to take the people from where the inner urban stopped at the corner of Garland and Pontiac Drive, it would be quite a walk for them to come down here to the inn. So the buggy probably went up there to pick them up and bring them down. Plus the ladies would be dressed in their beautiful gowns and they didn't want to get all muddy walking on the dirt roads. So we thank you for jo to Joanne for finding this booklet. The inn was designed by uh, William B. Stratton, who was a Detroit architect. He was married to um, Mary Chase Stratton, who was the um, founder of Poabwick Pottery. And we, you can see that we ha this is our um, claim to fame, our po Poabwick Pottery that was saved from the original building here. And Joanne also has a part in saving that for us. She found someone to professionally remove that, save it, and then put it back in our um, new community center. It says, warm the hands and cheer the heart. And so we're very pleased to have that in our new community center. 
Well, uh, the, the hotel was constructed in 1893 and for approximately $25,000. Uh, here's a view. Uh, they also promoted this as a, um, as a place to come and boat and fish. This would be a draw for bringing people. They even advertised as far as Chicago for people to come to Sylvan Lake, our little Sylvan Lake, as a, as a resort area way back then. Here's another view. Uh, this one says, on the point, and it's so interesting to me because we have always called this body of uh, land out here the point, and it goes way back to the 1890s that this name was still uh, was promoted back then because this uh, land separates Upper Sylvan from Lower Sylvan, and you came over a little bridge, so this is actually an island out here that we're on right now, and so that name goes way back uh, to the 1890s. Here's another view of uh, what it was like out here. And, and Sylvan means trees, so uh, it's just natural that there were a lot of trees out here at that time. This is one of their signs, uh, their promotionals, their advertising. You could take the trolley out here for 25 cents, come and see the lots. In fact, it says, this was their sales pitch, it said, um, an excursion and sale of lots at Sylvan Lake. Remember, we're going to sell lots and you make the price. Terms of sale are $10 down, $10 in 15 days, and 10% purchase price quarterly thereafter. This makes it possible for each and every one to buy a lot. Five handsome cottages will be built and given away absolutely free as soon as 150 lots are sold. <laughs> so you can purchase, if you purchase, you may win one of these. Well, we, never, we don't know if any of those cottages were ever built. There's, I don't see, we haven't re found any evidence that that ever happened, but it would have been neat that, uh, if that had really happened. But he knew, Merrill B. Mills knew that the inn would only survive if, with their summer people coming here. It wasn't going to survive in the wintertime. So they really tried to rent it out to people that would come um, to see and um, be here in Sylvan Lake. Um, this is a, his idea was, Merrill B. Mills, that he, this would be a whole community, a whole resort. It would have three, it was 300 acres in total with 1,300 build, building lots, six public parks, and this site alone is four acres. It would have a school, which was already built at that time, a depot, and some, some churches. Now, fortunately, they didn't go ahead with the 1,300 lots because that would have meant our lots would have been very small. Most of the lots in Silver Lake are 50 feet, but 1,300 would have really narrowed it down even more. But you can see the, the circle in the picture up here shows where we are right now. And the other large um, areas are some of the parks that were planned for this area. Most of the street names are the same. Uh, that were uh, on this map, and uh, so we're grateful for that. Uh, this is another picture of it. Again, that's the circle that shows where we are right now. And on this one, right here, it shows where the inner urban went through Sylvan Lake. In fact, there was a stop right here at Pontiac Drive and Garland, and another one down here by Maplewood. So there were not any um, depots that we know of, but there were stops for the, where they could get on and off the, um, the uh, trolley at that time. But unfortunately, the inn came to a demise. Um, it lasted only about 10 years, and on October 27, 1903, it burned to the ground. And this is what the newspaper said about it. It was dead when it was born and growing stiffer with rigor mortis in each succeeding year. The Sylvan Lake Inn was cremated today. That's what the free press or one of the papers had to say about it. It was never really, uh, it was never really a success, unfortunately. But Merrill Mills and his um, associates really had an idea that this would be something one of the days. So. Now we go on to the inner urban, which Merrill Mills had a big part in also. He was the director of the Detroit Transit Railway at one time, and so he found that this was the answer to bring people out here to the inn, because this was well before cars were invented. 
there, you know, there was no other way, um, besides um, horse and buggy or horseback, to come to Sylvan Lake. So they, he brought the inner urban out here. So uh, this is one of the trolleys that would have traveled down Sylvan Lake. If you notice on the front, it even lists Sylvan Lake. It says um, Oak Grove, which is down on, um, just off of Orchard Lake Road, um, Orchard Lake, Pine Lake, Cass Lake, Sylvan Lake, and Pontiac. So coming from the south, those are all the stops that, that would come along the, uh, uh, on the trolley that you could come. So for 25 cents, you could leave the hustle and bustle of the city to come out to this serene area of Sylvan Lake. And it does say Sylvan Lake right along the edge of the trolley there. So um, they, uh, it was just really neat that these, this really happened right here. A short stretch of track went through Kego Harbor and Sylvan Lake was originally laid by this Pontiac and Sylvan Lake Railroad, and that's the one that Merrill Mills founded. There were several stops in the area so that you could stop at Dollar Lake in Kego Harbor, at Cass Lake and Sylvan Lake. And the line continued on into Pontiac. And all of this was purchased by the Detroit Urban Railroad in May of 1901. And this information is from Brian Golden's book about the inner urban. If, uh, it's now out of print, but it's uh, fascinating to read. Uh, these pictures were given to me by uh, Sylvan Lake residents. The one on the left uh, shows that the trolley tracks went right down Garland, uh, even into, into the 1930s. The man on the right uh, passed away about 10 years ago, but I think he's waiting for the uh, to take the trolley into school. And one of the things that he liked to do was to, ride, to get on the trolley and hide under the seats of the trolley. Uh, and just for fun, just for something fun to do. But uh, in fact, our house is in the background in this picture, so it's really kind of neat to see uh, this picture. This shows where the trolley went way back then. Um, starting at the bottom, you would start up, um, that would be Grand River, the, the uh, road on, the, on an angle. Then it would come up Orchard Lake and make all those stops and then come through uh, Orchard Lake, uh, Pine Lake, um, Cass Lake, Sylvan Lake, and up to Pontiac. It would go up to, um, actually it came through on Garland, and then it went up out to Telegraph, north on Telegraph, and then east on M59 or Huron Street, and then down Woodward, and make a big circle so that you could just go right, uh, you know, go right back home again. So that was uh, a neat way to travel, and it's unfortunate that all those tracks have been taken up. Um, this shows where all the inner urban went around Michigan, which is really an extensive area, all the way up to Saginaw, to um, uh, Utica, and even over to Lansing and Grand Rapids. So the trolley was very extensive in this part of, uh, the, in, of Michigan. Well, after <coughs> the end burned down, Merrill Mills was a ge very generous gentleman. He was also very wealthy, but he was very generous. And he gave this property to the Detroit Free Press because uh, they were going to develop a camp here for underprivileged children. This is a picture of Arthur Mosley, who in 1906 decided he would like to send some poor, underprivileged newsboys out to the um, country for a week's vacation if they couldn't afford one. And so he put an ad in the paper and he asked the local um, farmers if they could um, take in a boy for a week or two. Well, a lot of them agreed to that. They thought it was wonderful, send out a boy. Well, little did they know, but it got back to, Mer to um, Mr. Mosley that the boys were expected to work to pay for their week's vacation. And so he put a stop to that. And that's when he decided to open the camp right here on this very property. So he then put an ad in the paper and he asked um, the little children, he put an ad on the children's page of the, of the Detroit Free Press and he asked them to wrap up a nickel and a piece of paper and send it to the Free Press to be used to send a poor crippled child to, the, to camp for a week's vacation. So enough nickels and dimes came in that first summer to send eight children out here to Sylvan Lake to go to camp. And it must have been really something to, to leave the city life and come here 
in this beautiful location. This is the earliest picture that we know of. This past summer, three of us from Sylvan Lake went to the Detroit Free Press where they let us um, go through their archives and they gave us these pictures of the early camp here on this location. This is showing the boys in 1908, it was just boys until 1909, just showing um, what one of their chores, one of their daily chores was to clean and fill the lanterns. Now can you imagine that happening today, that letting little children um, use kerosene? I can't imagine that, but this is what they had to do. They also helped with bed making and dish washing the dishes and uh, all the kind of chores that needed to be done around the camp. In fact, one of the, when they washed the dishes, first of all, they had to go and get the water out of the lake. They had to um, dip it out of the lake, bring it up and put it in big wash tubs. And then they would build a fire and they would uh, heat the water and then they could wash the dishes. But there always was a supervisor behind them who was swishing the mosquitoes away. This was like a swamp part of it, at least down by the lake. So if you can, I mean, it would have been a wonderful place, but there were also a lot of mosquitoes here at the time. So, um, and this is a picture of the first picture we have of the girls' camp. And look how beautifully the girls are dressed. Uh, and they're pretty dresses um, with lots of tucks in the front and everything in, in 1909. But all but one of them is barefoot. Isn't that interesting? Um, and the beautiful piano, I'm sure that this was donated and one of the counselors is playing for them. Um, but I'm sure at that time those girls did not have play clothes and girls didn't wear slacks or shorts at that time. So this is what they had to wear and this is what they brought to camp. And, but the, this, and they were still sleeping in, in tents at this time. It said um, they needed five special tents for the girls. So to make them um, comfortable, and they needed to be practically rainproof. Well, practically rainproof <laughs> might not do it if there's really a downpour. So they asked the boys and girls again uh, to send in money to help pay for the tents, and the first tents cost $15. And uh, they also had one um, city organizations that backed the camp that helped to bring um, things, uh, uh, provided supplies. and. Uh, other items for the camp. And here's uh, the boys waking up in the morning to Reveille, I'm sure, um, or to a bell, uh, getting up and getting going in the morning before uh, they finally had some buildings. Well, Ford Motor with Company was one of their supporters, and they um, offered their two of these cars to bring the children out to camp. And it was probably the first time these children had ever been in a car. And can you imagine riding a car like that? I mean, it would be a thrill for us today, I think. And the flag, it's such a neat picture, I think, of uh, bringing the kids out to camp. This was about the 1920s, and this is when they, uh, it was now all in wood. They were no longer in um, tents. The large building was, was also provided by the um, Countryside Improvement Association. That association has been going on since, well, I'm not sure how long, but I know that it is still an active organization. So they provided that building for the camp. Um, one of the things is when I mentioned they were underprivileged children, many of these children did not have enough to eat at home. And when they came to camp, they could eat all they wanted as long as they ate everything they put on their plate. They could drink all the milk they wanted. And this rarely happened at home. And some of them drank eight and 10 cups of milk at a meal because it was just so good to them. And they brought out fresh vegetables um, and um, the food was very wholesome. It was planned by a dietitian to help the children to build them up because they didn't have enough to eat at home. This is a closer picture of that other one where it does say the Detroit Free Press <coughs> Fresh Air Camp on the top there. But they would go around to the Eastern Market and other markets and bring in food for the kids so that was very fresh and good for them. Here's a lady that worked in, in the kitchen. She was a cook for 14 years at the camp. So we have an idea of what it looked like inside. The, and the kids, of course, the kids love baseball. If you look beyond that, I'm sure it's our lake right behind us here of uh, the kids playing baseball and 
and playing outside. Every morning they would get up and they would go swimming before breakfast. That was the best way to get them invigorated and uh, hungry before breakfast. And the children did come out later in buses. In fact, um, one of our residents, uh, Mrs. Josephine James, can remember the children coming out on the bus, yelling and screaming their heads off as they're driving down Pontiac Drive toward the, the uh, campsite. So uh, here they are waiting to board the bus in front of the Detroit Free Press in Detroit. So there are three buses ready to go to bring the children out here. This is what it looked like a little in, in the 50s. And this picture is interesting because the, pic the building on the left was the kitchen. Uh, it was built for the kitchen, and the building on the right was the uh, activities building. The building on the right is the building that uh, we, it was a big room for our community center beforehand, and it actually had a stage in it. Every night they had. Um, some kind of entertainment. In fact, the lady that lived across the street was one of those that would go around and organize people that lived in the community to come and entertain the kids. And it was just, uh, and I remember as a child coming to sit on the floor and watching movies and watching the entertainment. It was just the highlight of the week for us. But those two buildings became our community center, our former community center. It didn't have that overhang, but then they joined the two together with like a breezeway, and they finally put a bathroom in there in the 1970s. So it was used well for quite a while without even a bathroom in the building. But those two buildings became our, our previous, and this is what it looked like, our previous community center. And that building was raised, and it was kind of sad for me, um, having remembered growing up here and, um, and coming to sit on the floor and and being part of the children that were here. So, um, but we did save that one uh, spot, the, our beautiful Puabic tile from the, uh, and which we have right here. And this is our building, which was just dedicated in August of 2008. So we're very happy to share it with all of you and that we're very happy that you could come tonight. Mm -hmm.